Amen. How many, how many are thankful for the mercy of God this morning? Aren't we? Amazing every day. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us for the third worship experience of the weekend. We're honored to have you. And we're excited about the kids' wing being opened up today. All the classrooms are opened up, the new ones that we just have created. And we thank God for the progress of the new building. Uh, the parking lot's paved. Come on in that awesome, that paved parking lot. Moving forward. Thank you so much for partnering with us and being a part of what God is doing here. And as my wife mentioned, if you're a guest today, you know, thank you so much for coming. We would love the chance to get to know you and serve you. And we just believe that the best is yet to come. Amen. You know, so far this year, the greatest number of all, over a thousand people have received Jesus this year. Come on, that awesome. That's an awesome, amazing thing. And, and we love to count that because I believe God does. So we're honored to have you, and we just believe that today's going to be good. And so I pray that all of us would receive uh, from this message and that we would just move forward. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this 11 a.m. worship experience. We're honored to be here. Thank you so much for what you're doing. We thank you, Jesus, that your love and your power is real. I thank you for protecting us in this room and as we leave. I thank you that all of us would lay down any resistance. We would lay aside any distraction. We would just receive from you today. And we would all be better and take our next step closer to you. Bless those online, through the online campus, and in this room, and in the kids' wing. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. So we're in the second week of our series, Peacemakers. I'm going to define here in just a moment the difference of a peacekeeper versus a peacemaker. And I believe that every one of us in this room and online has the opportunity to be a peacemaker. You know, that Jesus, he even said, blessed are the peacemakers in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. And yet for my own life, and I think for all of us, our tendency is, is to possibly be a peacekeeper. Because how many know this is true? Our lives are busy. They're hectic. And at times, how many have experienced being overwhelmed? I know I have. And in those moments, it's like to take the extra steps of being a peacemaker seems not worth it, and it seems like it's too much. But I believe that great, uh, that great growth happens when we choose to be a peacemaker. And I believe that you and I in this room and online, we cannot afford to live life through any little white lie. So I'm going to preach a message this weekend entitled Little White Lies and how powerful it is to live in the truth. Now, how many know it's good to tell the truth? Not too many. It is good <laughs> to tell the truth. At one point in my life, I remember having to remember what I said, what story I said to what person. I don't know if you've been there before. I remember even feeling like I had to look over my shoulder. And it feels so much better to be at peace that I don't have to remember what I say because I say the truth. And it feels really good to not look over my shoulder because goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Can I get a witness at 11 a.m. And so uh, in this message, what I want to do is I just want to share with you a challenge. I'm going to read a, a few verses from Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to show them on the screen. And I want to show you the challenge. You know, really this seems basic, but there is a challenge for all of us through our lives to live in the truth. And then I want to give you three practical ways you and I can overcome any form of little white lies in our life and choose to be peacemakers. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Ephesians chapter 4. If not, or your phones, whatever. If not, you can just follow me on the screen. I've read these verses before. I've preached from uh, these verses before here at City more than once. I love these verses. I think they're very practical and yet very challenging because they really speak to our day-to-day -day life and practicing our faith. And this is where I need help the most. So notice in verse 25, he just straight up says, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit says, so stop telling lies. Amen. <laughs> Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And notice this. And don't sin by letting anger control you. How many have done that before? I know I have. Don't the sun go down while you're still angry. Now notice verse 27. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. 
So the enemy wants us to live by anger, live through anger, which gives him access to our life. Now, I could read more verses, but I want to jump down to verse 32 just for the message today. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Now, this series is is entitled Peacemakers, as you know, because we believe that God has called us and wants us to be peacemakers versus being peacekeepers. And I want to define that before I move on. Being a peacekeeper is, is, is convenient, and I think we're prone to do it. And it's almost like this. It's like, shh, don't talk about this to him because he can't handle it. Don't bring that up to her because she'll go off. And it's almost like we walk on eggshells trying to keep everyone happy by not ruffling the feathers or by ignoring the pink elephant, whatever you know, phrase you want to use. And we're just kind of doing life, just trying to make sure everyone just stays happy. And we're just kind of you know, putting this out, putting that out, or even you know, trying not to let the fire start. And I understand that. It's easy at times. But Jesus has called us, I believe, to be peacemakers. Peacemakers are people that seek to make the peace. In other words, they seek confrontation in that they're not going to let confrontation you know, boil over into bitterness or unforgiveness. They want to have resolution. They seek to come to the highest point of unity. They seek to make amends. They seek healing. They seek reconciliation. And this could be in the home. It could be with extended family, friends, a sports team, a corporation, a church. It could be whatever. God wants you and I to live as a peacemaker that we're actively looking for ways to make the peace versus trying to make everyone happy and just kind of like, shh, Let's just kind of navigate all this, and we'll be happy. There's something better. I believe God has better for us. How about you? Amen? And yet this subject of telling the truth and overcoming little white lies may seem very elementary, but in reality, it's very challenging. To me, it's not surface. This is deep. It's you and I embracing, no matter our age, the, uh, the promise and the need to live in truth. Now, I've lied before. How about you? I've lied a lot. Have you? Thank you for not lying and telling the truth. <laughs> All of us have. Everyone in this room and online at one point in our life have lied multiple times to cover something, get out of something, or do whatever. What's interesting is even as children, we have a moral compass, and we know what's right and wrong. Even recently, one of my sons, he said a cuss word at a video game. We didn't know it at the time. And so he ran out of the room, and he went up to his room, and, and, and my other son was looking for him and found him in his room, on his knees, on his face, out loud praying to Jesus to forgive him for saying a bad word. That really touched me. He knows there's a moral you know, I mean, direction, a compass, that this is right, this is wrong. We all know that. And we know lying is wrong and telling the truth is right. But how many know sometimes it's easier to live in little white lies? But God has something better for us. I think it's so important that you and I understand this is not just to be a quick lesson. This is a lifetime challenge for you and I. This is a challenge that you and I would choose to live in truth. We would embrace the challenge that I live my life in and by truth. I don't live in the shroud or in the shade. I choose to come in the light and I choose to live. And what does that mean? What does this challenge mean of you and I coming into the light and living so that we are free from any form of deception. Well, first, I believe you and I have to embrace the huge step, easier said than done, of first telling the truth to ourselves. You know, if any of us are lying to anyone right now, it's because we're first lying to ourselves. And the greatest lie any of us can ever tell is the lie we tell to ourselves. The first step in you and I embracing, you know, being a peacemaker and not living in and through little white lies is first, really, we embrace the truth of us. Is there areas of our life that we can improve in? Is there areas of our life that we need to, you know, maybe, you know, get better in or to make adjustments or changes in? And even, even when we tell the truth to ourselves, we're humble enough to receive constructive criticism from a trusted friend. Because the Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. 
I don't know about you, but I'd rather be hurt by a friend than kissed on the cheek by an enemy. And when we have the right people in our life, they'll tell us, hey, man, you got mustard on your face. Or go brush your teeth a second time. I want to know that. So the first challenge of this, you know, for being a peacemaker, we're not settling for shh, just everyone be happy. You never want to be quiet. We don't really talk about something that's really true. We just kind of keep it surface. No, we're called to something better than that. I understand why it's easy to be a, peace, I mean, a peacekeeper, but we're called to more. So we're a peacemaker, and a peacemaker embraces the challenge, and they choose to tell the truth to themselves, and they get better. Now, recently this happened to me. I love to sing. And I even sing to my wife. Friday night, we were in the car. I had my Pandora station on, uh, 80s rock. Come on, somebody. And uh, thank you, thank you. And a great artist came on, one of the best artists of all times. Don't laugh at me. Lionel Richie is a bad dude. I'm going to tell you that right now. And if you don't believe me, I don't care. So he came on. And he started singing that, I mean, I mean, that song, Stuck on You. And so I said, boys, here's how you do it. So they're on the back seat. And I start looking at Summer, stuck on you. Got this feeling down deep in my heart and I know it's true. Yes, I'm on my way. Come on, Lionel. Come on, Lionel. <laughs> Needed a friend. Yeah, I can, a little bit. So, but when I do that, she laughs at me. <laughs> and she always says, you don't sound right. I'm like, woman, be quiet. And then I'm at home and I sing worship songs, I make up songs, I sing different types of stuff like that. And she's like, all the time, she says, you don't sound right, you don't sound right. I'm like, man, just be quiet and let me sing. <laughs> and so recently I said, I'll prove it to you. When I was a kid, I used to be in the choir at church and my mom directed it and I used to sing the tenor part. And I used to sing on pitch. I said, mom, prove this. Can't I sing tenor and can't I sing on pitch? She said, no, you can't. I said, come on, mom. Come on, man. So I have embraced the truth that I can't sing. But I choose to make a joyful noise to the Lord anyway. Come on, right? I know that's a funny thing or whatever it is. But I want to encourage you in truth. I'll share a little bit later how I had to tell the truth to myself. All of us have to tell the truth to ourselves about, you know, maybe fickle things and also serious things to have life change. I'm going to move on with this. The more we resist facing the truth about ourselves, the more we block God from healing ourselves. Please hear me on this. Please lean in. The more we face the truth about ourselves, the more God's empowered to heal us. So the challenge is, is that I tell the truth to myself. And then, of course, the second one is I tell the truth to others please hear this, is that I respect God, I respect myself, and I respect the other person enough to be truthful. I choose to not live in disrespect of myself, God, or others by living through and by a lie. I choose to be truthful. And so the challenge for peacemakers is really for everyone, but for the series for peacemakers that you and I choose, we choose to tell the truth to ourselves. And if someone else tells us truth, we don't get all offended and mad. We're humble enough to receive constructive criticism. And we get better. And then we tell the truth to others. And we live by truth. And we choose to do our best. Now, the reason why this is a challenge among many things, before I move on to the practicality of how you and I can overcome little white lies, found in verse 32, the reason why this is a challenge is because peacemakers seek to tell the truth to themselves and others is because how many know this is true? The truth can hurt. And yet, even though the truth can hurt, God can heal us. How about this? The truth can risk the status quo of the relationship or the dynamic. Maybe on the job, you have a lot to lose. I understand that. Maybe in church, in one of our groups, on the, on the dream team. Who knows what? Maybe with extended family, maybe with those right next to you. The truth can risk changing the status quo. Another reason why this is a challenge is because the truth never knows how the other person will respond. So sometimes because of those things and many more, 
We choose to live as peacekeepers. We would rather just shh. Let's not go there. Let's not face the truth about myself. Let's not face the truth of what I need to share to someone else. I, it, it, it's too much to lose. However, I would challenge that's a wrong mindset. Because anytime we live through a little white lie, we're in the shade, and that's where we can be overcome. When we come in the light, we live, even if it's scary. So how do you and I overcome how do we overcome little white lies? How do you and I choose to be a peacemaker in our lives, that we choose to make the peace with those closest to us or whatever? We, in other words, we don't live through bitterness. We choose not to live through grudges, through you know, being full of unforgiveness. We don't live through getting even with people. We, you know, we go to a higher level that Jesus asked us to do. Because he wants us to do our best for him. But this is hard, isn't it? Truly coming into the light and live. So how do you and I overcome little white lies? I'm going to give you three practical steps. I believe for us, no matter where we're at in this room and online, in the journey of your faith, every one of us has a next step. And I pray you would take it today. You know, for example, if you haven't received Jesus, I want to encourage you to do it today. And let him be the greatest person in your life and connect to God. If you have done that, then begin to grow in your faith, learn about the Bible, learn when, and learn what the Bible says about you, and begin to get rooted, as I would call it, in your faith. As you grow in your faith, then discover who you are, because every one of us in this room and online has multiple gifts that you and I can share, and the reason why that's important is because the church is not trying to get something from you. It's because God's trying to get something through you, because every human being has a need for fulfillment. And God has designed it to find that through him. So when you and I discover the gifts he's given, then we can share it and find fulfillment in a core part of us that we all need. Then as we discover who we are, we can team up with something bigger than ourselves and begin to make a difference in someone else's life. And when we do that, we are moving forward in our faith and we get better in the process. We do all four steps every weekend, every worship experience, and we do it through build. And I want to encourage you to move forward and take your next step because there's great power when you and I do that. So for this message, our next step, as we grow in our faith, how do we overcome little white lies? Notice verse 32. And I want to give you some sub points for notes if you're taking them on your worship guide. Please hear this. I've preached this verse before, but I'm going to recap it again this weekend. We are peacemakers, and we seek to overcome little white lies by first being kind to each other. In other words, we never use the truth to hurt someone. Now, that's not a contradiction to what I just said about the truth can hurt. What I'm saying is we never use the truth as a knife to stick it in someone and, see, and say, I told you so, there's the truth. Now what? Kind of attitude. We don't do that. That's not a healthy thing of truth telling. That's really trying to jab someone and get back at someone. That's not how we use truth. We also don't use truth to manipulate or get our way. So we choose as peacemakers. We have no agenda of getting our way. We let down or we let go of the agenda of getting even or like telling some secret to like punctuate our point and stab them and say, now what? We don't do that. We choose rather to be kind because we are honoring God, we're respecting ourselves, and we're respecting them. So we choose to tell the truth through kindness. We choose to... As a peacemaker, we choose to desire that we have peace with God and we have peace with ourselves because how many know we can't control what the other person's going to do? But if I can be kind and not manipulate and not like fight or not get even, but just simply relate truth in kindness, I can at least have peace with God and peace with myself. I'm hoping that this can really work out with this individual, but if it doesn't, at least I have peace with God and peace with myself. And I can move forward. So a peacemaker is not someone that's shh, 
let's not do this. A peacemaker saying, you know what, there's a rift, you know, or something was said or not said, or something has happened, or something has not happened, and we need to, t- and we need to talk. And I am searching to have truth in my life. So I'm not living in the corner of darkness. I'm coming out of little white lies, and I will be prepared, and I will choose to be kind with the truth. So that I'm seeking to be a bridge. I'm seeking, here's another way of saying it. This is a word we don't really use a whole lot every day. But the Bible says that you and I have the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, you and I, as a Christ follower, have the opportunity to help someone else have reconciliation with God. And also, we have, through the Holy Spirit, the wisdom and the tools to have reconciliation with other people. We seek to be kind with the truth. How about the second one? We seek to be tender-hearted with the truth. Tender-hearted means that we are believing or desiring for the best outcome from the situation. Love speaks truth, but that doesn't mean we can say it however we want to say it or have an agenda in place that is not right. Please hear this and lean into this, please. The truth helps our heart stay tender. Lying empowers our heart to be hard. When you and I choose to be truth or to tell the truth, it it helps our heart be humble. It helps us to be tender. It helps us to believe that there is a potential best outcome of the situation. It helps us not be hard-hearted and and, and jaded and, 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 and conning people. It helps us to be tender, to reach for that bridge, to reach for that highest point of unity. To be tenderhearted is, is, is simply, I choose to believe that the best scenario can happen from this situation. It helps us stay open, free, clean, and pure. We want the best. Tenderhearted also is, I lay down my agenda. I want the best for them. See, a peacemaker is the leader. Not the follower. The peacemaker is seeking to, to, to set the tone in the family. Set the tone maybe on the job if you can. Set the tone in the group at church, on the team. Set the tone um, on the sports team or whatever. It's to set the tone. We're not going to walk on eggshells. And we're not going to have these massive bombs where we just you know, wail and flay and go off on each other and can't even hardly communicate. We're going to rise above to a higher level and we're going to be tender and we're going to lay down our agenda and we're going to seek to come out of little white lies and we're going to say, I want the best for you. So I'm going to tell the truth to figure out a way what's best for you. And then someone will say, wait a minute, what's best for me? When we serve others, God always makes a way for us. When we serve ourselves and start shading, hiding, cutting corners, we're going to fall into our trap ourselves. That's why it's so important that this simple subject of truth it's not just if you were raised around church, maybe you've heard the term Sunday school. It, it, it's, it's not, you know, for the city kids today to learn about thou shalt not lie, okay? But as adults, that we live in the truth of God and that we choose to be a peacemaker and we embrace the challenge by telling ourselves the truth, telling others the truth. How do we do that? How do we overcome little white lies? Very practical. We seek to be kind. Number two, We seek to be tenderhearted. What the Bible says in verse 32, and my last one here, the big one, and then I'll close, is we forgive one another. Just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Now, for some reason this year, I feel like that the Holy Spirit is having me say this more than once. If you've been around, I've said this several times so far this year. I said it last weekend. I've, I've noticed the, the propensity for me and all of us, Christ followers or not, to not forgive. To live life to get even. To live life secretly or outwardly hoping someone else falls. I understand those feelings, don't you? But there's a better way. Why? We don't forgive people because they've earned it, deserve it, or we feel it, or we don't. 
Those are all things that we don't gauge forgiveness by. We forgive others because God in Christ has forgiven me. Let's just take a memory trip here, that memory or, or a trip to memory lane. Let's think about all the things we lied about. All the things we've hid, known or unknown. And when you and I came to Jesus, he forgave us. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, meaning if you fly east, you can never fly west again. If you fly west, you can never fly east again. What he's saying is when you come to me, I forgive you and I obliterate the chalkboard of issues against you. I clean your slate And it's from that position that we forgive other people. We rise above bitterness. We rise above resentment. We rise above getting even. We rise above, like I said last weekend, grandma's rules and great grandma's rules and my rules. No, 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 no. We do it because we've been forgiven. And we honor God because he is amazing and gracious. And Lord knows I didn't deserve it. I don't know about you. I can't say that. But for me, I didn't deserve it. And he gave it to me freely. So peacemakers are living life not in the shroud of little white lies. They're choosing to be people of truth and live in that truth. And, you know, for this message is we embrace the challenge and and we're honest with ourselves and we're honest with people. And how do we do that? How do we conquer little white lies? How, you know, what's the practical steps we take? Well, we're always kind. We're always tenderhearted, and we always forgive. It's profound. It's simple, but it's profound when you and I walk this out. And in closing, I want to encourage you. Notice in verse 27, it says that anger gives a foothold to the enemy. Conversely, truth gives a foothold to for God in our life. So you and I have to know that unforgiveness fuels anger. Anger fuels unforgiveness, potentially. Not only that, anger and unforgiveness can fuel lying, and lying can fuel unforgiveness and anger. That's why we choose to be truth, or to tell the truth, rather. We choose to be people that are honest. We don't ever have to remember And we don't ever have to look over our shoulder because, oh, yeah, goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. I've told the truth to everyone. I feel good. I feel clean. I'm not perfect, but, man, I don't have anything to hide in public or in private. It feels good to live that way. And that's how God wants us to live. Now, in closing, I want to say this. I know what it's like. I don't want to ever preach at you. I want to talk with you, but, but understand this. I know what it's like. And you've heard me say this if you've been around. If you haven't, I'm going to just repeat something. I know what it's like to be touched, man, just, I mean, I'll use the word supernatural, by God. At a church camp, life was totally changed. Um, The summer before my senior year of high school totally got just like, whoa, life transformed. Even left this city and left my high school and my friends to go to a new high school to start over my life because I knew I couldn't do it. And I was changed from the inside out. I know what that's like. It's amazing. If you haven't taken that step, please begin it today. But then what's interesting is that was in 1996. Then in 2007, so 11 years, I experienced the healing power of God. But, but, but I had to do something according to this message. I had to take the challenge and tell the truth to myself. I had to own the fact that I had anger issues. I had to receive constructive criticism from my father and my mother and my wife and a psychologist. I had to just humble myself and stop making excuses and embrace the truth that I was perpetrated on when I was a child. And so I had to embrace that so God could heal it. I've experienced that. And I'm a better man for it. I want to encourage you today that no matter where you're at in the journey of your life, please receive Jesus. 
If you haven't, man, you got to do it. This is the thing. This is not being narrow-minded. This is not being a bigot. This is not being, you know, whatever. This is life and life more abundantly. The Son of God came to the earth to live with us, to die for us, to be raised from the dead, to get us to go with him forever. Receive him today. He's the greatest person you can ever know, and it will change your life forever. And I pray that everyone will receive that. And I also pray, hear me, and don't say, well, I'm a Christian because I was serving God for 11 years preaching. And I know the difference. Hear me. I know the difference to receive that, which is amazing. But then I also know what it takes to receive healing. And I'm in the process still of being healed. And I know how different it is. And how powerful it is when you feel the living touch of Christ inside of you. So I would ask you today, choose to be a peacemaker. Don't settle for being a peacekeeper. I know it's easy, but don't settle for that. Choose to go to a higher level and be a peacemaker. Be a leader. Be someone that's not going to live in the eggshells of life and and try to avoid a pink elephant, but you're going to tackle that thing pin it to the ground, and you're going to seek truth, and you're going to seek to be a leader, and you're going to overcome little white lies by being kind, by being tenderhearted, and by forgiving, and at least you can have peace with God and peace with you, and you can walk down the street with your head high because of God in you. If you believe in Jesus, give him a great hand clap of praise. He's worthy today. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. You online, please respond to God. Stay with us here just for a moment online. You in this room, please bow your head to heaven. More importantly, if you would, bow your heart. This is a great moment. It's an eternal moment. I even would say it's a supernatural moment. You would say today, Pastor Dave, I've never received Jesus in my life. You would say, I've never done that. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm asking you to receive the Son of God. And you would say, I've never done that. Or maybe you would say, I have done that at one point in my life, but right now I am so far from God, I know it. I need to be back where my heart and my spirit is telling me I should be. As heads are bowed and hearts are bowed, you would say, I've never done that, or I have, and I want to come back to him. Both of those are biblical, and yet Jesus is the remedy for both. If that's you right now, raise your hand to heaven. I want to pray for you to receive Jesus today in this room. God bless you today. Thank you. Son. God bless you today. Thank you. People coming to Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. It's good. And how many say today, Pastor Dave, you know, I know an area in my life, maybe more, where I'm tempted to live through and by little white lies. I see where this subject, I'm tempted to be a peacekeeper, but I'm challenged to be a peacemaker. And maybe you want the Holy Spirit to help you be kind. Be tenderhearted and to forgive, to overcome little white lies and to live in truth. We're imperfect, but you want to live in truth and you want to set the tone. If that's you today, all over this room, raise your hand to heaven. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me. Thank you. Hands up all over. Pray with me out loud, please, so no one is left out. And please say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours and I run to you. Please forgive me for anything that's wrong. I leave that. And I say yes to you. I choose you over anything else. Through the Holy Spirit, help me be a peacemaker. To live in truth. To be kind, tenderhearted, and to forgive. To be free in Jesus' name.